If you have your Bibles with you, open up to Revelations chapter 3. I'm going to be using the New Living Translation this morning. Revelations chapter 3. And I want to speak to you about something that God put in my spirit. I thought the message was going to, my plan initially was to preach on something else, which I'll probably preach on later. But this is what the Lord gave me for today. So it must be uh, very right now-ish, what he wants. And I believe it'll, be, I believe it'll bear witness to your, old, to, your, uh, to your spirit that this is the word that we needed today. So in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, I'm going to read it. Starting at verse 7, it says, Write this letter to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one. Verse 8, I know all the things you do. And I have opened a door for you that no one can close. That's important. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. I want to read that part again because that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the verse eight, I know all the things you do and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. So I want to talk to you just for 30 minutes because that's all I have from the topic, an open door, an open door. We've said, you know, 2024, open door for 2024, 2024 is the year of open doors. And, but I want to give you some information about this open door, because to say there's an open door for you in 2024. Oh, yes, Pastor. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. God is an open door. I want to give you some information with that, that I believe it'll help you to be able to really walk through your door this year. What is that door? What does that door look like? I'm somebody's probably asking those questions. If you ask those questions, good, you should be. God, what is this door you open for me? What does this look like? When is this door? How do you want me to go through this door? Uh, we need some information with, with the word. We need some understanding with the word. And all you're getting, get an understanding. Get some understanding. So today I believe we'll get some understanding on this whole idea of open doors. So we're going straight to the text. Our text today in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, we are looking at the author of this text, John, the disciple, writing down what he received during a vision that God had given him. Now, listen, in this vision, he is shown stars that represent angels. He is shown lampstands that represent churches, and he is hearing a voice and when he looks to see where that voice is coming from, who that voice is coming from, he sees a figure of a son of man, which we know is Jesus the Christ. Jesus is giving a message to each of the angels of each of the churches. And there are seven churches. And this church that we're talking to right now, the church of Philadelphia, and this is not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. These were in the Asia Minor area. There was a Philadelphia over there too. But the, this church that he's referring to is church number six out of the seven that he had to give messages to. And this church was considered a faithful church. This is one of the more positive messages out of the seven churches that he delivered a message to. Five of the churches, the message was, there's some things that you're doing wrong and you need to repent of it. But in two of the seven, he didn't mention anything wrong that those churches was doing. Instead, he told those churches, just hold on, keep the faith, 
Don't get weary in well-doing. You're on the right track. Don't let the enemy steal your crown. Don't let the enemy steal your joy. Don't let the enemy steal the works that you've, you've already done for me. I see everything that you're doing. Hold on. And this was one of the churches that was one of the two that didn't have any thing that he said they needed to repent of, but yet they were a faithful church, and he was just encouraging them, keep being faithful. Hold on to what you're doing. Persevere to the end. Don't get weary in doing right and well. And so Jesus, after he, after we understand this, Jesus states to this church three characteristics of himself that he wants his church to know. Three characteristics that he wants his church to know. He says to his church, number one, I'm holy. Two, I'm true. And then the third one, this is the one we want to focus on, is he says, I have a key. <laughs> From the one who is holy and true and who holds the key of David in his hand. Now we've got to understand what he's telling us. There's three things he wants this church to know. I want you to know first, I'm holy, I'm true, and I have a key in my hand. And it's going to be very important. Let's look at the holy part. He says, I'm holy. It's coming from the one who is holy. Why is it important for God to let his people know that he is holy? This is some of the problem with the church today because the church needs to be reminded that the God that they serve is a holy God. And if they're not reminded how holy he is, it will affect the way they deal with him, approach him, and the way they act in their lives. So it's important that we are reminded who God is. And God says, I want to remind you that I'm holy. Well, somebody might be saying, okay, thank you. What does that mean? Holy means I'm set apart, I'm sacred, I'm separated, I'm a cut above, I'm different, I'm pure, I'm morally blameless, I'm incomparable to anything else or anybody else. Sometimes it's so hard sometimes to define something by what it is, so let me define it by the opposite. It's not, it means it's not sin, it's not wrong, it's not bad, it's the opposite of defiled. That's what holy is. And so we need to understand his worthiness, his greatness. We need to worship and honor him correctly. We need to realize how far apart we are in being right and good. And we, are, we, we need to realize our need for him to help us to be created, to, I mean, help us to be who he created us to be, which is like him. And he is holy. That's why several scriptures say, be ye holy for I am holy. Second thing he says is I'm true. Why is this important? True just means I'm right. Always right. In fact, he's the only one that's always right. Sometimes I think I'm right all the time, but I'm not. Don't look at me like that. Sometimes you think you're right all the time and you're not. He's the only one that's right all the time. He's right. Truth and being right has to do with also freedom. It has to do with hope. It leads to complete wholeness and fulfillment. When you are connected to what is true, you are safe. You are kept from deception and falsehood and darkness. He wants us to know he's holy and that he is true. Now, here's the third thing he wants us to know. He wants us to know I got a key. What does that mean, I have a key? It means I have the power to open and shut a door. <laughs> no one can shut what I open or open what I shut. I have a key. Look, I got a key. Now, in our houses here in the States, we use our key for the outside right, to lock up before we leave so nobody can get in with a key, right? You have a key, you lock. 
Nobody can get in. When you get ready to go back to your house, you use the key, you open the door. Nobody else can open that door, shut that door, keep that door from opening when you have the key. Now, when I go to other countries, I notice that they have a key for the inside and the outside. So they can lock it from the outside and they can lock it from the inside. <laughs> so you, if they lock it from the inside, you can't open it. If they lock it from the outside, you can't, you know, get in that way. You know, whatever they shut can be open. When they get open, you can't keep it shut because they have the key for access. And so keys mean we have access. And, and this is important because Jesus is saying, I have a key. I have the power to open and shut a door. Now, why is he telling this church that I want you to understand and know that I have a key that I want to open a door for you? Now, in Isaiah, before I say that, Isaiah 22 is connected to this passage in Revelations because he just doesn't say I have a key. He says, I, this is Jesus, the Messiah, the, sitting at the right hand of the Father, the one who's already ascended up to heaven. And he's telling a message to his church back on the earth. I have the key, not just a key to open the door. I have the key of David. You know, David's below you. What do you mean? You're the Christ. What's the key of David going? What does that mean? Isaiah 22, a verse, Isaiah 22 and 22 will help us understand that. It says, yes, I will drive you out of office, says the Lord. I will pull you down from your high position. And then I will call my servant Elikim, son of Hilkiah, to replace you. And I will dress him in your royal robes and give him your title and your authority. And he will be a father to the people of Jerusalem and Judah. And I will give him the key to the house of David. The highest position in the royal court. When he opens doors, no one will be able to close them. And when he closes doors, no one will be able to open them. So we look at Isaiah 22 and 22, and we find out in that reference that there was a key that was given to the king, the king of Jerusalem, that gave him access, the power and authority to open whatever door he needed to open in his kingdom or to close whatever door he needed to close in his kingdom. And so the reason why Jesus uses I have the key of David is because, yes, he has all power and all authority in heaven and in earth and under the earth. But he wanted to signify or specify that I have a key specifically for those who are on the earth. For those who I have given the highest positions, for those that I have put in a place of authority, I have given them I have a key for them to open any door. This key of David, one who has the authority to control anything in that person's domain, the king of Israel, God's people on the earth, headquartered in Jerusalem, he had that power, David. And since Jesus is the son of David... <laughs> The Messiah, the prophesied one who would come through the line of David and sit on the throne forever and ever. Yes, he has the key of David. So we are the spiritual Israel. We are the kings of the king with the key of heaven and earth. His spiritual kingdom is on the earth. He has the greater authority. He said, I have, when he said, I have the key, I have the key of David. He's saying, I have the greatest key that is needed on the earth to unlock anything that needs to be unlocked on the earth. Now, Revelation 3 and 8 says, I know your works. He goes on to say, and behold, I have set before you an open door. And then he goes on to say, you have little strength, yet you obey my word and you did not deny me. 
He says, I know your works. What are the works? If you read this, the last part of verse eight, it tells us their works were they had obeyed his word and they did not deny him. So there were works, watch this, associated with, I have a key to open a door for you. He says, I have set, he didn't tell any of the other churches this, I have set before you an open door. I have opened a door for you, if I can say it that way. It means the same thing. He said, I have opened a door for you. And he also connects that with, I know your works, meaning I have opened a door for you because I know your works. What are your works? You have not denied my name. You continue to obey my word. Because you continue to obey my word and not deny who I am, I have opened a door for you. Oh, bless his name. In, the, in Matthew, he tells his disciples, remember when he tells his disciples, I will give you the keys to the kingdom, right? And we talked about that. And the keys are two. He has two keys on the ring. What, key, what do those two keys do? What did he say right after that? I give you t- I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. And then he says, whatever you shall be bound in, and whatever you shall be loose in heaven. So I'm, he told his disciples when he was on the earth, he said, I'm going to give you the two keys. He didn't say there were two. He just said keys. I'm telling you there were two keys. One of the keys says bind on it. The other key says loose. One key says you can start something. One key says you can stop something. Great, that's right. You got a key to open something and you got a key to close something. He told us, I'll give you two keys. Now, the keys he gave his disciples, stay with me, the keys he gave his disciples are not the same key he's talking about in this story. Oh, man, this is good. The key, this key that he's talking about here, he didn't give to us. He gave us the keys to bind and loose on the earth, whatever I you bind whatever you lose, it'll be done. He gave us those keys, but this key he hasn't given to us. This key is his. He said, I have the key, right? And nowhere does it show us that he gives us the key to open the door with this key. With this key, he says, I have the key. And he says, I have opened the door. It's as if you were following me to walk through a door and I opened the door for you and then you went through. He's telling you in this season that the door that I opened for you, I opened that door for you. This is not a door you got to open for yourself. This is not a door you got to scream and shout out. Uh, You got to bind. You ain't got to loose. You ain't got to praise in this door. This season, we're going to do that anyway. I already seen your work. I already know you haven't denied my name. I already know you obey me. In this season, you're not going to have to do anything because I got this key. I'm going to open this door for you. This key I'm not giving to you. This key I'm using for you. The power and the authority and the control of opening the door for you to walk through. I'm doing this. I'm not giving you this key. I'm I'm using it to open the door for you. All you have to do in this season is walk through the door that I open. God, I feel the spirit of God. Somebody catch a hold of that. This is your year, 2024. This is the year of open door. God is saying, all you have to do is walk through the door that I open for you. 
That's what he's talking about when he say open doors in 2024. Now, if he opens the door for you this year and you don't walk through it, whose fault is that? Don't be mad at God and say, God, 2024 went by and I didn't, I didn't, I'm in the same place. He's going to say, well, I, door number one, you missed it. Door number two, you missed it. Door number three, you missed it. I was leading you to go through that door, but you was too afraid. You was too scared. You talked yourself out of that door. You talked yourself out of your blessing. You, you, you went back into fear. You went back into speaking negative. You went back around the wrong people. You start watching the wrong things. You missing the door that I'm opening for you. It's right in front of your eyes. God, help us. Because you must understand there are some doors you can't open with your keys. God, I've been fasting. And God, I've been praying. And God, I've been to shut-ins. And God, I'm going to put oil on my head. And God, I done went here and did this. And I shut my mouth. I didn't say that. And God, I prayed for this person. And God, I helped in this thing. And God, I'm doing everything I know how to do. And it just don't seem like the door is opening. There are some doors you can't open. Even though you got spiritual keys, even though you got the keys to bind and lose, there's some doors you can't open. There are some doors God has to open for you. And then watch this. Then once he opens the door for you and you go through that door and you are now in a new place, don't forget you still got your keys. See, you can use your keys wherever he sends you. You can use your keys whatever you go through, whatever door he is taking you through. You can use those keys. You always have them at your disposal. But there are some doors your keys aren't going to work for. You're going to need him to open the door to get you to the next season, to get you to the next place, to get you to the next job, to get you into the next relationship, to get you to the next connection, to get you to the next business deal, to get you wherever you need to go. Those keys are influence and authority. But in Isaiah, it says, it's explaining the key of David in that picture in that scripture when I was sharing with you, we see there's, some, there's a shift, right? There's somebody being removed. There's somebody else being put in place. There are things happening now. Keys are being used. There's a shift. There was a change of position. Somebody had to be removed. Somebody else had to be added. Someone had to be trusted with keys to the kingdom who had never used those keys to unlock the door before. God was making some switches. God was making some changes. And the Spirit of God wants me to let you know, you've been saying, God, how come these certain doors haven't opened? Because God says I need to remove some people and I needed to add some people and I need to switch some things around. I needed to shift some stuff. I needed to change some stuff. It wasn't time yet. But when it's time for me to unlock the door for you, can't nobody shut that door. This is your season. That's you. Your name has been called. A position has been granted to you. To me, God has unlocked the door for you already. It is under God's authority because he is the only one who can decide how these doors get open and shut and when and where. There are doors that he has opened for you. Hear me. Open door means God has already unlocked some doors for you that have not been previously open. Because of the timing. You remember the story about Joseph? Joseph was forgotten about by men. He stayed in the prison a few more years because they forgot about him. But he was not forgotten about by God. It wasn't God's timing for God to unlock an open door for Joseph to walk through next. Joseph had got the keys to Potiphar's house by his faith and his gifts. Joseph had got the keys to rule in the jail by his faith and his gifts, but it took God to open the door for him to get his keys to the governor of Egypt. He could not lock that door with his gifts and with his faith. 
He had to wait for God's timing. When it looked like God had forgotten all about him, when it looked like he wasn't ever going to get out of that place, when it looked like he was stuck in there for things that he didn't even do, he had to wait for God. Man failed him like man's going to fail you. But God remembers, and in God's time, he'll open a door for you. That's gosh. If he got a call the king to dream, he'll open the door for you. If he got to make some things happen, he got to open the door for you. I told you this story when I used to work at the refinery, how I was taking my, going on my first missionary trip to Malawi, first time to Africa in 2004. I said, God, I heard God say, I want you to go. I said, well, God, if you want me to go, you got to, all these things got to be taken care of, my children, my money situation, my job situation. I went to my job, I never asked for time off before, and my boss said, You can't have it. I was frustrated and mad and saying, God, you told me to go. She telling me I can't go. I'm, you know, I was ready to fight it. And the Lord said, you don't need to fight this battle because if it's a door, I'm opening for you. I'll open this battle for you. And then he gave me the scripture. He said, pray this scripture. The heart of the king is in the Lord's hand and he can turn it whichever way he wants. So I started praying that, and all of a sudden she came to me one day, came to my office almost in tears, saying, I need your help. If you can help me in this situation, I will give you whatever time off you want. God just changed. Because when he opens a door, can't nobody close it. Your boss can't close it. Your family members can't close it. Your husband and wife can't close it. Nobody can close a door that God opens. There are doors of opportunity. These are doors of opportunity and authority. Watch this, and I'm almost done. Colossians 4 and 3, Paul says, I need you to pray for God to open unto us a door to minister. In 2 Corinthians 2 and 12, Paul says, I came to preach and a door was opened up to me. Acts 14 and 27, Paul gave a report of what he had done and told how God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. In 1 Corinthians 16 and 9, Paul said, a great and effective door, effectual door, has opened for me. When God is opening a door for you to walk through, it's his time for you to walk through it. These are doors of opportunity. These are doors of new beginning. These are doors where you welcome a positive energy and blessings, new blessings into your life. They can signify the invitation to explore new paths, to embrace a new ch- change, embark on a new journey of personal and spiritual growth. These are doors. Anybody hear what I'm saying? And he says, I'm setting before you an open door now, which no man can shut. He's not shutting doors in this season. God, I feel the spirit. He's not shutting doors. In fact, God said, I shut the door in the last season because there were doors you weren't supposed to go through. There were places you weren't supposed to be at. And so I loved you enough. You thought because I wasn't opening up doors that I had a problem with you. No, I was, I was protecting you. I was shutting doors in your past so you wouldn't go through those doors because in this season, season, I'm opening up doors because I want those doors to be the ones you go through. Hallelujah. Jesus. (laughs) You can go through the open ones now because God done shut the wrong ones already. He had to shut the wrong ones first so you can go through the right ones. Ah, Isaiah 45 and 1 There was a king by Cyrus, God would anointed Cyrus, a Persian king. And he says in Isaiah 45 and 1, Cyrus, my anointed, goes forth to do what I have allowed. And doors have been opened for him and gates could not be shut. When God gets ready for you to rule, when God gets ready for you to seize your moment, which have been given given to you, there's nobody that can stop it. And God wants you to seize your door, seize your opportunity right now. Right now, I come against the spirit of procrastination. Right now, in the name of Jesus, lift your hands if I'm talking to you. I come against a spirit of procrastination. 
of letting another year, another day, another month, another week go by without you doing the things that you know you're supposed to be doing. Turn off the TV, whatever you got to do. Get off of the social media. Do what God has called. Seize the moment. The door is open. The door is not always going to be open. And God forbid that you miss the open door. And then you don't fulfill your destiny. You don't see what God said. You don't see the manifestation of the promise. Let me hear and I got to end. Revelations 3 and 20. This is, I guess, is the only reason why I'm going to use this board today. Y'all know I'm challenging this area of drawing. That's why I didn't play that game on New Year's Eve. I saw the way that y'all laughed at Brother Daniel. All right, we got, at least y'all know these are doors. What I found out reading, this, is, this just blew me away. We're going to end on a high note. What I found out when I was reading Revelation chapter 3 is that I'm focused on this one door I just preached to you guys about. And this is the most important for us right now. This is an open door that God says, I have opened. But what I found out when I kept reading the, in the same chapter of Revelation 3, something hit me and blew me out of the water. In Revelation 3 and 20, it says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That same, that same chapter where earlier he says, I've opened doors for you that nobody can close. And I close doors and nobody and I have the key of David in it. And he takes us to all these scriptures talking about all these doors he has open for us. And then he says at the end of that chapter, and he's not just speaking to the church of Philadelphia, our church. He's speaking to all the churches. And he says to them, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him. And I said, OK, God, I didn't see this door thing, you know, down here. I said, so. And the Holy Spirit said, yeah, there are two doors. I said, OK, there's two doors. OK, well, <laughs> I know about the one door. You said I've opened the door for you. I know about that door. He said, yeah. He said, I, I opened. I love you. You haven't denied my name. You, you're doing you're obeying what I'm letting you know. I got open door. I got an open door for you to walk through in this season. I, I, nobody can do it but me. I'm the only one that can open this door for you. But when he comes to Revelations 3 and 20, he says to me, he says, but you have a door for me. I have a door that nobody can open but me. And he says, and you have a door that nobody can open but you. He says, all I ask in return for the door that I open for you is that you open a door for me because there's one door that I can't open. The, there's a door that I, I've set things up to where there's a door that I made it to where only you can open. I can't even open that door. And he says, so in exchange for me opening the door for you, for you to fulfill your destiny, for you to fulfill your purpose, for you to do everything I've called you to do, for you to do everything that's in your heart's desire. All I'm asking when it's all said and done is will you open your door for me like I open a door for you? Now, the door here is the door that is our door that he says, behold, I'm standing now at your door. And I'm knocking on your door. See, many people use this scripture when they do an altar call. But this scripture wasn't written to unbelievers. This scripture was written to believers. 
And he said to his people, he says, Behold, I stand at your door and I'm knocking. Well, God, how come you just don't go through? Because I don't have the key to this door. This is a door I gave you the key to that if you don't let me in, I can't come in. I'm going to stand there and I'm just going to knock and see if you're going to open the door. And if you're willing to open the door, I'll come in any time, any day, any moment, and I will fellowship with you. I will sup with you. I will spend time with you because for God, that is his greatest door. Some of our greatest doors is my greatest door is just to just to get a new Cadillac. My greatest door is I can just get. That, that mansion, if I can just have that man, that woman, if I can just have so much money, if I can just be able to travel around the world, that's, that's some, for some of us that. But for God, the greatest door you can open for him is the door of you saying, God, come in and spend time with me. Because he created you for fellowship. Every three o'clock in the morning, at least, and always around three o'clock in the morning, God wakes me up. Why? He's knocking on my door, saying, I'm knocking. I can't come in unless you let me in. I want to come in. And I want to spend some time with you. Is that okay? So today we leave. Understanding that God has opened a door for us in the earth. But hopefully we also leave understanding you have a door that God's knocking at, that he wants you to open for him. Stand to your feet.